What people don't see is the pain. And I'm gonna be real. I didn't sign up for people to talk bad about me. I didn't sign up for people to bash me and hate me. What I signed up for was to help people and create content. So when I got into your story, what I found most interesting it is it seems like the classic, like, I want to be an achiever. And then you do this massive pivot. Walk me through that pivot if you can. Like, how did you go from being wanting to focus on the kind of the career path to being and doing your own thing? And it seems like you're throwing yourself into your true passion now. A little bit of my story is also too, when I was growing up, I had to take care of my grandmother. And of course I wasn't going to go to college because I knew that my mom wouldn't be able to hold a head over, a, a, a roof over her head, you know? Um, so I made that decision. I took care of her. I worked nights for about four years. Um, that is really part of my journey of why I went into the corporate world because I really wanted to do something in fashion originally, go to school in FIT in New York City and be like this whole fashion guru. I wanted to be the girl that worked for like Dolce & Gabbana and she was the last girl that checked all the models before they went on the runway, you know? So I was really that girl. And, um, you know, I, cause I never went to college and finished college. I straight from there, I went into banking. Cause I was like, I need to make more money. You know, I've been out yeah, of college because, for because fashion and art direction and banking just yeah. go hand in hand. Right. Yeah, because I was, it just fell into my lap and I just became a banker. And from then I was like, okay, I'm making good money. Okay. Average money. But I always had this like voice in me that I wasn't enough because I didn't have a scholarship because I wasn't, I didn't have um, a degree in this, right? So that voice actually made me challenge myself to become better. I was like in a competition with myself in the corporate world, really. Mm -hmm. And so from there, I became like a, what they called a customer service rep at the age, I think of like 21, 22. And then from there, I went to an assistant manager role, a bank manager role, and then an assistant vice president role, then into a private banking VP role of the bank at the age of 29, 30. And I was the youngest person to have that role without a college scholarship or anything. Um, and I was making over, you know, six figures for sure. thinking that was like amazing. Right. And um, good. You know, as soon as I wake up every morning, I just feel unfulfilled. I'm like, what am I chasing? I've been in competition with myself. Like really, what is my passion? What is my true purpose? And I was hiding behind that. And then I was like, I just want to help people in love because I always wanted to help people in love. And that comes from a lot of my childhood upbringing. And I was like, let me just start testing the waters. And I started speaking at big events about um, love and relationships um, and then I dived in a little bit more to get my coaching certification. I studied NLP. I read a lot of books, but I started coaching a little bit. And um, from then I was just like, I'm going to quit. Huh. I'm saving my, I'm quitting. Before, yeah. before we blast through the story too quickly, I want to, I want to park or, or spend a little bit of time on a few of these points, because honestly, you know, when we look, you know, us average people look at successful people like you, uh, you know, what we see is where you are today. And then we're going to see the next amazing thing in the next. And what we don't realize is often, you know, the people we look up to have started with less than what we have, or the challenges haven't been easy, or it's not always there, or we're dealing with these inner struggles. And so the, the competing with yourself is a really interesting thing mm -hmm. because, um, I mean, I must imagine that, you know, starting as a CSR, um, you know, at a really young age and then within like seven or eight years, having the success after success after success, um, how did you battle the difference between the security of the career and the security of the job and the money and the feeling of being the youngest VP in, in the bank and all of that stuff? And then just deciding like, Help me understand the moment where you realized, like, I can't be doing this other safe thing. I need to go pursue this other thing. The moment I couldn't get out of bed to go to work. Honestly, it got to that point. I, it had to get to that point for me, though. Um, I mentally could not get out of work. I mean, out of bed. And I already called off two times in a row. Um, everything I was saying was so negative, And I was turning into a negative person. And I noticed in my life, I started drinking a little bit more too. 
than I normally would. I mean, I enjoy a glass of wine every once in a while, but I would drink every night. And then I also to the clients that would call me, um, I wasn't feeling a connection with them. I wasn't feeling, it was always a complaint. It was always this, it was always that. And it was not like it was their fault. It was just more of like, it just wasn't for me. And it was taking a lot of my energy, right? It became like an anchor. It was holding me down. And so it held me down so much that not only did I drink a little bit more, but I couldn't get out of bed. And at that moment, I was just like, I have to do something. So what I did in that particular moment is I had to come up with a plan because I didn't have a vision in front of me. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I had nothing to look forward to. So in that moment, I was just like, I need to stop. I need to plan something. I need a vision. I need something to motivate me right now because I'm literally at my rock bottom in my job right now. And even though I'm doing all of this and people are like, wow, you're so great. I can't believe that you're doing this and reminding me that I'm a VP of a bank and only 30 years old with no college degree every day. Right. But yet I'm probably better fit than a lot of people in there, not to place judgment on them, but because I had so much drive and determination because I was trying to prove my, to myself the whole time. So I exceeded in the expectations my boss wanted to give me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so from there, and that's why I was just running dry. I was in a competition with myself. And so I had to come up with a plan because in order for me to get out of bed and know that I can walk into work the next day, I knew I had to come up with some type of plan in order for me to be able to continue it out for a month or two months. Right? So I gave myself actually two months. I'm going to get, I prepared like a mini business plan. Where do you need to cut your income? What do you need to do? Do you need to move back in with mom? Do you need to do this? You know, what is it that you really need to do so you can take yourself to this next position? And so what I did was I made a business plan for myself and I said, I'm giving myself two months. And so every day I said, what are you working for every week? I literally mapped out my weeks, my months, everything. What website are you building? What research are you going to do? What books are you reading? I mean, I mapped it out so clearly that I could not confuse myself. And do you, you, know, do you usually confuse yourself or are you usually <laughs> this detailed? Um, I'm, I think I'm pretty detailed in general. Yeah. It's a, it sounds like you're like, yeah. came up with a plan, two months. These are the books. These are the courses. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. But I'm also visual, like I'm a visual learner. And I, if I see it visually, cause I know from my own learning, how I, you know, how I learn most is visually. And so that's why I have to plan it out and have it out because if I see it every day, it reminds me of my goal and I wake up. And so I gave me and myself that two months and I followed that plan. Okay. Okay. I, I'm going to, I'm going to parse this apart step by step. I love this so much. <laughs> so, so you're facing this like dreaded feeling of going into work, you know, you can't do it. You have a plan, but to have a plan, you have to know what you want. So mm -hmm. how at 30 having this career, like how did you know that what you wanted to do is either what you're doing now or whatever it is you did next? Like yeah. so many, so many of us struggle with like, I just want to do something that will make me feel good. I just want to do something that will bring me success. I want to do something that'll bring me money. I don't care what, just something. Cause we're like desperate for the escape. Yes. But, yeah. but we struggle with that, like the crystallization or, or the clarity of like what we're working towards. So how did you know that connection and love and relationships and all of this stuff was the thing that's your jam? Yeah. So I wanted something fulfilling, like you're saying. And as when I was growing up and this is, I'm a true believer that everybody has a purpose, no matter what in this world, no matter where, what area, what walk of life, anything you come from, everybody has a purpose and no purpose is big, no purpose is small. Your purpose is your purpose. And I'm a true believer for myself that my pain, your pain actually can turn into your purpose. And the pain points of your life can turn into your purpose as well. What you've done, what you've overcome. What do you, what do you and mean by that? So my pain is my purpose. So what I mean by that is, you know, growing up as a young girl, I had a father that was in and out of my life. Um, he tried his best so much to love me. He was a great man because he did want to love me, but my father growing up also had a lot of issues, mental issues, um, alcohol issues. And I look at my father now and I just say, if only someone could help him and see past his issues, because as a little girl, he was depending on me to love him, to receive the love that he never got from his parents. And so, and 
in according to that he was heavily nar- he was very narcissistic um he was verbally abusive in ways to my mother never to me but he was always i was always a dysfunctional home with my father and so my mother and my father separated and when they separated i would still see my father but i would always see him so sad mm-hmm. and so at the age of the, the first day memory i can remember is like 6 or 7 i always had it in my mind to always need to fix him i needed to fix him i needed to heal him i needed to help him imagine a 7 or 8 year old saying i need in their mind to help my father why i'm the one trying to figure out what life is all about so i dismissed a lot of myself i dismissed a lot of my self love i dismissed a lot of everything and really kind of core good and having good friendships because i fell into a lot of pain i fell into a lot of hurt i fell into a lot of confusion i had probably fights with my mother you know and just going back and forth and i just remember always reading books i remember being in school in middle school and i would read I would pretend I was reading a history book and inside there would be a book about like narcissism or like love narcissism wasn't really a thing back then but it was more about like toxic relationships or difficult relationships and I would stay up in my room at night in my headphones and I would have to wake up at like 6 7 in the morning and sneaking in my room listening to Love Line Dr. Roof at the age of like 14 15 16 17 like what kid does that? And the reason why I was doing that was because I was in search for answers. And also I was in search of comfort. And I felt like only those people could comfort me because they knew what I was going through because of the people that would call in, say things. And I was just like trying to find answers and answers and answers. And I couldn't really find the source to fix my father. I'm sorry? To fix what? To to, to To help my father. I wanted my the father, I just wanted my father to be happier. Mm. I just wanted my father to not be so difficult or sad. And I knew he had issues because he would confine to me in some of those issues, of course, too. And so that didn't end up working out well because I chased all my life to fix my father that I forgot about myself. So then I got into broken relationships. I started leading my child, my adulthood from my trauma. So I got in relationships with unavailable people. I got in relationships that were abusive. I got in relationships where I abused myself possibly and not even, not even looking at my own needs. And so I grew up like this and, you know, unfortunately enough for me, my father and me don't have this relationship where it's a daughter father relationship, but I've forgiven him. I have no ill will to him. And a part of me always wants to know that he's going to be okay but I've reached a point in my life where I've healed and uncovered so much. And that's why I say that pain that I had, I can now turn into my purpose because all those years of my childhood that I chased to try to fix my father, now that I've gone through all the lessons, all the resources, everything, I now turn into my life now today. And I can tell you that I have helped so many men 10,000 times more. So that's what I mean is I've turned my pain into my purpose because now that I couldn't fix my father, guess what? Not saying that I'm fixing men, but I'm helping so, so many men and I'm guiding them into instrumental relationships, healthy relationships, or just bettering themselves in their lives. Hmm. And so at what moment, I guess, in your 20s or in your banking career, or even that night or day when you're sitting there and going, I can't get out of bed. How fast was the clarity for like what I need to do? Because yeah, putting before you put the two month plan together, again, you got to know like in your heart or in your soul that you're going to take this plunge, you're going to leave your career, you're going to put the plan together because you want to step out in faith or in hope or in, in whatever it is in your dream to be able to pursue this thing. Yeah. Well, that's two things here. I, I, I really think, and I'm really going to be honest that there's more than one bedroom moment. There is a moment that you're in the closet and your knees are on the floor and you're crying, right? There's so many of those moments, depending on what we're going through in life and our challenges. In particular for me, when it came to the career shift, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something in love for sure but I didn't know for sure what I wanted to do. But what I did know is that I had to listen and pay attention to people that were already in that specific niche 
and start seeing what they were doing. Start seeing if this is what I would want to do. If I liked to do this, what is working in this niche? What is not working and diving in? I'm a true believer is the more that you invest in yourself and research and put in the work, your answers are going to come to you. Hmm. And I always say, I ask my people that are trying to find their purpose or what they want to do in life. I, I always say, I ask these two questions and the two questions are one, write this down and you just say, what are the most painful moments that you've gone through in your life? And you write those down. You can say a divorce, you know, or this or bankruptcy. And now you're fine. And now you're teaching financial etiquette or financial education, excuse me, to people possibly. Right. So there's moments in people's life that people go through because there's no mistakes in life. They're only lessons, right? And those lessons can Did then- Did you always turn. believe that though? Or is that something you've learned through time? That's definitely something I learned through time. Okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise I was going to say, you were born like no. super genius, yeah. reading books, super young, all no, of this no, stuff. No, 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 no. That's definitely something I learned over time. And also by coaching numerous people because I see the shift in the breakthrough, you know? Mm. Um, so the question is like, what is the painful moments that you've gone through? Number one. And then number two, what is it that excites you? And then just continue to write those two things down and have a like storytelling moment with yourself and then read those things to those two things back. And that can tell you a lot about what could be your purpose. What could be a passion of yours? What can make you money too at the same time? Hmm. So I heard really in passing you know, it was a comment about a relationship you once had that had physical violence where you felt really threatened. Um, and so I know you've spoken openly about some of the bad relationships, some of the good ones you've been in. Obviously, each one of these has shaped you. But what is, I suppose, the, the, the ones where you've heard, learned the hardest lessons and you're just like, got to make sure I don't do that again. Right. And, and I imagine this just must inform with compassion and understanding and empathy at the other people you're helping, because again, all of the knocks that you've gotten along the way. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, I think a big part of my coaching practice too, is that I don't judge because I've been there before, you know, I've been in places before, and I've also been that woman that they're talking about before. And so I know where that mindset goes. Um, and I also know that the caveat, the catalyst, the catalyst to me and my growth were my relationships to not only my life lessons, but I think love and loss are one of our biggest lessons in life. And this is where we can learn a lot about ourselves is in love and loss. And sometimes we need relationship number seven to teach us communication. Sometimes we need relationship number five to teach us what we want and what are our values, right? What are our boundaries? Sometimes we need relationship number four to speak up. But the two things I can tell you in regards to my personal history is I, I told you about my story with my father, but also too, I never really felt love, like a true love for my father because he wasn't able to love himself. So how does he love his daughter, right? So I remember my first year relationship, I was 21 years old and in a relationship for five years. That man adored me so much that he finally showed me how a man should love me. But the reason why I couldn't obviously faith, and I don't think it was the right one for me, but the reason why he came into my life was not only to teach me something, but I was there to teach him something, but also too, I wasn't ready for that big dynamic shift, right? Of mm -hmm. like settling down and getting married at 21. 25 by then 24 then we broke up and I got into really toxic relationships. So I went from how a guy could treat me a wonderful, amazing man to so many toxic relationships to the point that I got into a relationship that was very, very physically abusive, not in the beginning, but in, in the, at the, towards the end. And I found myself in this abusive relationship. And it's because I, even though the man saw so much love for me in my, my first relationship, I was still learning how to love myself. And I had a lot of empathy and I had a lot of compassion. And so the abuser looked at that and said, this is my perfect target because that's what happens. And so one of the things that I went through in this is there was times where I've, I remember I almost lost my life to abuse with this man. There was that one moment and now when I reflect, what, what happened, if, if I can ask, and I, you know, and I, and I feel like I have to ask what happened. Yeah. So I think when I got to the point where I almost lost my life, there was times where I would sit 
we would argue, right? And he was very um, physically violent. And so the time that I lost my life was, was just from, he was almost, I almost passed out from him strangling me. And that right there is where I had this like epiphany and I was just like, I need to get out, but I just don't know how, right? And so anybody that's listening who has some somewhat faced an abusive relationship or knows someone that's in an abusive relationship, here's the thing is it's really important to understand when someone goes through an abusive relationship does not mean that they're weak. The strongest people can actually get into relationships that come from abuse, not meaning that they can see, like I'm not saying someone that's healed and knows what they want, but someone that's confused and doesn't really know what they really want, but also they can be really strong too, but they can find themselves in abusive relationships because the manipulation and the abusive relationships are really real. And mm-hmm. I I tell you this, if you do know someone that is in one or that has gone through this is just have compassion and empathy for them. Listen to them, be there for them, right? Don't judge them because the moment that you judge them, you will not figure out what is going on with them. But the moment that you don't judge them, you will be the person that they run to when they decide that they need help because they're the only people that can change it. You cannot tell them anything else Mm -hmm. because what happens in the manipulation is there's a lot of gaslighting. Typically there's a, a lot of, nar- it's a narc can be with a narcissist. Typically abuse comes from a, a narcissistic person or someone that is de- dealing with um, um, alcohol, uh, alcoholism, some type of substance abuse, not all the time, of course, but sometimes it's more than the cases are more higher on those. And so, you know, when you, when we talk about that, it's really important to also understand that the manipulation that takes place in there there's sometimes blame where if I leave this person, this person will suicide. If I leave this person, it'll be my fault, right? Mm -hmm. So they have to go through that journey themselves and walk them through that. But they also have to see that someone is still there to support them from the sidelines, of course, because it is hard for a family member to face this, of course. And then be there to support them. Give them little doses of maybe a book to read. Turn them to a retreat, you know? Have them do a meditation with you. Have them do a yoga class with you. Show them little ideas of what it could be like outside of that relationship that they're is it, in. Is it, the, is it the significant other's job to try and fix them or is it not better just to leave? And um, I ask that because I've had family members who have stuck around, maybe not in super physically abusive relationships, but certainly I have come to learn that abuse is not just about the physical. It's yeah. not just about sexual abuse there's a lot of other forms of, mm-hmm. of abuse and especially toxic relationships. Yeah. And is it not better just to put yourself first and get out? 1000% it is. Okay. But you I know it's hard. I know it's challenging. I know, yeah. I know all those things. I'm just, yeah. It's hard for some. So here's the thing is relationships are also, um, relationships can also be, our repeat of our own trauma, a repetition of our own trauma. So for example, a lot of people stay in relationships like this because of self-esteem, of because they're scared to be alone, right? I mean, loneliness is a huge thing and that's not talked about as much, right? Or because of the kids or because they've invested so much time and money, right? And so many other things or because they're just quote unquote used to it, right? And so a lot of times people stay in these toxic relationships for a long time because they feel like they deserve it on a conscious and an unconscious level. And so that comes from a lot of the ways that they've been up brought in their upbringing. You know, if they had a dad or a mother that abandoned them, or if they had someone that didn't, a parent that didn't pay attention to them. So they're, what they're going to do is they're going to go back to their trauma and find someone that's probably doesn't pay attention to them, probably not in the same way, but in an indirect way in that partner, because what happens is the limiting belief, they go back to home because as a child, your, your mind forms in different stages. And one of the biggest stages is from seven to 14 and then seven below. And what happens there is your mind is starting to process what is real, what is right what is not. And so if you're going through trauma in those times, that's home for you. Hmm. So what you're going to do in your adulthood is you're going to try to find home again, because that's what feels familiar. And so if this feels familiar, this means it's home, even though it doesn't feel good. And then, you know, it's not right, but this is what you're used to. 
So that's why it's really important. Coaching is important. I think therapy is important. I think turning to in, within and doing the work as far as healing from your trauma is really important as well. So the thing that scares me, you know, I'm, I'm a father of four. Uh, my oldest is 14. My youngest is seven. Um, I know these are formative years. I know that, uh, you know, I feel like I'm not doing the job I need to do as a father um, because of my own issues that I'm working through. And I've spoken about on the podcast and what have you. Oh but the God. thing that's the scariest is that nobody grows up without some form of trauma. Yes. And so you try to index one way and then suddenly you didn't do this. You go that way and then you didn't do this. And then there's the school and then there's the friends. And then there's like, all we want to do, you know, when you're a kid, you know, all you want to do is find that comfort and that safety and discover who you are and find a place to fit. And all you want to do as a parent is try and get them through this. I would think, I mean, for me to become, I want them to be the best version of themselves, but I've noticed myself forcing them to be someone else i've seen when they're they're joyous full self and i say can you guys please be quiet we're at the dinner table like i could see my me wanting to make them my version of who i want them to be and that scares me Mm -hmm. but nobody grows up without trauma so all of us when we enter our 20s our 30s our 40s when we're in our first marriage or maybe our second or our third like it's just a question of how quickly can you figure this stuff out i mean is that really the answer Um, how quickly you can figure it out or just how deep it really is. And also too, who's your support system, right? Right. Because if you have a strong support system, if you have a great father and a great mother, that's there to talk to. And yeah, you know, parents make mistakes. I know, you know, parents make really mistakes. We're not perfect. No, there's no handbook for childhood, like how to raise a kid, you know, the right way. And even though there's so many people teaching it still, kids are different everybody is different. You'll have one kid and they like, will eat everything. And then you have one kid, same height, same, same dude, and literally won't eat nothing, but has, he's introverted. The other one's extroverted. And you're like, but they still came out of the same parents. Right. So everybody is different. So I think that the, what I've recognized, especially in my coaching practice, and especially with my husband too, is my husband and I have two totally different upbringings. My upbringing is just a mess. I'm a mess, right? My husband um, has a very good family. And one thing I've noticed about his family is they all stick together and he is pretty, I mean, the trauma that he probably has is he lost his father early, you know, a little bit about basketball growing up, but nothing that is just so much, you know, his parents were really strict and his father probably, you know, his mother and father yelled just like any normal parent would even mine. Right. But there was nothing significant that made him, um, get into depression or anything like that. Right. So even though everybody does have trauma, you can have trauma, a big trauma, right? I have a a client that just came to mind now. He came some, comes from an amazing, amazing family, but also his mother really babied him. Mm. And so he has really hard time setting boundaries with women and speaking up because on a woman's side, as a woman, obviously I'm in the men's space. I coach a lot of men. So I obviously have had a boy it'd be a little different in this aspect, but I know if I didn't understand this as a woman, I would want to teach my son how to treat a woman good. Right. But what we do in that gen- in general, when we teach a little boy to treat a woman good, and we only focus on that keyword, we only focus on that. Then this is where we, babe, we can nurture, over nurture him. Right. And then from there it goes to, but how about my needs? So you're telling me my needs are not valid. So you're telling me I now have to always look at a girl as my higher power or put her on a pedestal, you know? And so one thing that I will tell you too, is like, just from my own experience too, the more communication that you have with your parents and you're, when you're, you see your parents actually admit that they messed up, they're not perfect. Let's talk about this. Let's do this. That's not trauma. What happens there is like, I can talk to my dad about really mostly a lot of things, depending of course, but, um, the trauma also can, can become part of them. And so I, I feel all of two also too, because trauma is really talked about now more than ever. Mm-hmm. And I, and I am a big, and I talk about this a lot on my YouTube channel is I want to release the stigma that is attached to trauma because trauma isn't always a bad thing, right? Like, 
oh, we look at women and we say, oh, she has daddy issues, right? That's a common thing to say about women, but why, right? There's a common thing to say about men. Oh, he's a simp. Oh, he's beta. Oh, he's too nice, blah, blah, blah. So we constantly putting people down instead of recognizing how can we help them? And that right there is, I want to release the stigma of trauma being always bad because trauma is not always bad because trauma will never would have created Tony Robbins. Trauma would have never created a Mel Robbins. Trauma would have never created Esther Perel. Probably. I know her story a little bit, right? Ruth, Dr. Ruth, the, the one that started everything for us. I mean, she was in the, she, she has an amazing story. Right. So that's what I mean is like, you get so much, not only does it decrease someone, it doesn't decrease someone's value just because they have trauma. I think it increases someone's value when they can create something out of their trauma and find their way out as well, no matter how big or how little. I love it. And I feel like that, 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 that perfectly circles us around to, you know, you step into coaching, you know, your, your, your purpose comes from your pain. And so you launch this practice, this coaching company, this like you step out, you know, and now, I mean, even just looking at you and watching your stuff, I was like, I can see where she came from a fashion background. I mean, you have a sense of style where it's like, I need to, I need to up my game for my black V-necks and stuff, I think. But um, like how much of, how much of your journey and how much of you stepping into doing what you're doing, living your purpose, helping others. I mean, I, I, I feel like you're doing this boldly, but again, I'm looking from the outside and how much of this was just a collection of all of those little experiences that you never thought would all attach together are now coming into your life. And you're realizing, ah, this is how those things have all served me. Now I can actually step out and do my thing. Yeah. I, I, oh, that's a great question. Just a question though, just to get clarity. When you say you realize that I'm doing it boldly. What do you mean by that? I marvel at uh, your commitment to YouTube. I marvel at um, the, your, your knowledge, like, like how much you have committed to being very good at this. Um, mm -hmm. You speak um, with authority on subjects that I think would make most people blush. Um, I see, uh, I, I mean, from, from your story and being vulnerable, um, like everything. It's just like, it looks like you've got the package, right? Like it looks like, it, it looks like you are confidently being you and putting yourself out there. And, and now again, I don't know, I, I, I can confidently say that you probably don't always feel that way. You are in your head, you're in your business, you're in your life. It may feel certain ways, but from the outside, it's just, it looks so bold what you're doing. Yeah. Okay. Got it. I just wanted, I just wanted to make sure I understood what you meant by that. So thank you for clarifying that for me. Um, yeah, I, wow. So I love the fact that we're, first of all, I love the fact that we're having this conversation because this also is a reminder that a lot of people look at someone in the public light, let's just say as a public figure or YouTuber or whatever we would say. Right. And we think, that person helps so many people. Wow, they're so lucky to help so many people. But this podcast right now is helping me and you'll know why in a little bit. And also the clients that I help actually help me too. And they give me life. Um, and I get really emotional when I talk about it because this is something that I really do from my heart. Um, I know for sure, this is my purpose. This is my mission. When I wake up every day before my, hit, my feet hit the floor, I just pray to God and I say, God, just bring me the people that need my help. Bring me the people that need my help and speak your words through me in order to deliver a message, whatever those words may be. This is your business. I'm just your angel on earth helping other people. That is the thing I, can, I say every morning, right? And here's why. That abusive relationship that I talked about my father, my father being a narcissist and seeing that I grew up and seeing so much fear, sadness, and anger that I couldn't really do anything about it. But also it gave me so much empathy for that person because perspective shifts your reality. If I can look at these people and blame them and be like, Oh, they're, they're mean people. They're bad people. I now am still victim. Number one, but number two, I now am not flourishing in my life. 
And now they have actually more control over me than I do. But the moment that I look at them and be like, wow, his mother abused him when he was growing up. My father didn't have a mother or father growing up. That must have been really hard. And I just know that they were showing up for the best that they can do in that moment. I release all shame and I just come up with compassion and love, right? And so from that, it becomes freeing. And the, my persistence on YouTube not only drives me, but my husband as well. My husband is my biggest supporter, not only because my husband is one of the biggest entrepreneurs in France, and he actually helps people for a living too, but he, me and him are so on the path on our purpose and our mission together that our work feels like work sometimes, of course, when we have to do things we don't love. I don't like when people say work doesn't feel like work. It does feel like work sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it does for sure. <laughs> but then there's times where it doesn't, you know, because all I need to do is show up and people serve a purpose. But here's the thing too, is the things you see on YouTube, always putting out content, being very vulnerable, being very honest. When I talk about situations about sex, right? Like sex with men, erectile dysfunction, like I need to normalize it because it's the truth. Like we mask money. We say, you know, what is the one thing that you hear about money? The worst saying that you hear about money, probably. What is uh, one thing that you Money heard? corrupts. Yes. Money doesn't grow on trees. Money's for evil people, right? Money grows, you know, things like that. And that's one, that's one thing that we have to kind of get rid of. That's a whole other problem. But then there's a stigma around sex too. And I get it there's religion, there's beliefs. I'm not saying anything about that. But what I am saying is religious and beliefs and everything aside, people still procreate. And part of sex is really understanding how can I get better with myself? And so when I deliver these messages, the reason why I do it is because I also think I'm very professional. Number one, when I do it, mm -hmm. that's the number one thing that I want people to see me as because I'm here to help people. Like I'm not a YouTuber saying, oh, here's a day in my life. I'm a coach. You know, I want to be direct with my message. I want to be influential with my message, but I also want to help people where it's not shamed upon and they can be like, oh, wow, look at this video. I'm going to share it with one of my friends because her message actually just came across really classy and that was it, right? So I, when I do those type of videos, not saying that that's all my YouTube channel, but I do videos, more videos of other things. But when I do those videos, I think about how can I create this message to impact people as a learning and a teaching moment, right? Because this is not something that's taught in school. We're not doing this at all. And I hire the right people on my team, but I've also had pitfalls of not hiring the right people on my team. No one sees what goes on behind the scenes, right? People see this shiny, oh, she's making it all over. She's on, she has a Forbes article coming out. She's gonna be on ABC, Good Morning America. She's gonna do all this. She's gonna be speaking. She's gonna be on stage. She's made it, she's good, whatever, right? And then they kind of, they'll get you for every little thing. And what people don't see, and this is why I'm saying this is a blessing in the skies in this podcast, is what people don't see is the pain that I also go through. And I'm going to be real. It is not easy. And I just told my husband this. I didn't sign up to be criticized. I didn't sign up for people to talk bad about me. I didn't sign up for people to bash me and hate me. What I signed up for was to help people and create content that's mm -hmm. going to actually step into your homes completely free to try to help you. Yeah. But what people don't see is how much that actually can affect someone that really does it from the heart, right? The people will create YouTube videos. Oh, like she's teaching men to do X, Y, Z because they're trying to create their own fame from someone else's name. Yeah. Right. I'm going to be that's... honest with you. My, my initial reaction to a few of the videos I saw, saw was, <laughs> wow, this is really manipulative. Right. And I, I watched a video on, um, you know, the, 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 the five or whatever, the things to do in the first two or three days of a relationship to, you know, be mysterious, um, not over talk, um, mix things up, change things up. And my initial reaction was only like, wow, this is, this seems like it's playing a game and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I learn about you and then I get to know you. And then I understand your heart and what drives you and all these things. And I was like, these men need this help. Mm -hmm. These men need connection. These men need love. And I'm busy thinking of the, you know, the South Beach jock dude or whatever who's playing all these manipulative games. But 
these, these are like average, average, right, whatever, but these are, these are real people who want and need connection and love and help and you're helping them do it. And it's not that manipulative. Like I just, I even had to check my own judgment at first. Um, not that I would write a bad comment or anything, but yeah, I mean, it's like, you're, you're, this is when I say you step out boldly. I feel like it's like, wow, she just said that with authority. She just did that. She just put herself out there. And I respect that about you. Because at the end of the day, I want to help people really maximize their chances of getting results in their love life, you know? And yeah, I say you got to, like, I have known, I've done videos in the past where I say, and also as a coach, you see me grow on YouTube. I could take those videos down, but I don't don't, because I want people to see growth and where people start, but also too. And this is where it's, I'm not in the personal development round. I'm in relationships and love. So people always have an opinion, right? (laughs) Um, And The thing about this is I know probably what video you're talking is how to get a girl to think about you nonstop. And I'm like, you need to create a little mystery, wait two days or something like that until she texts you after you've been talking to her for a little bit. So here's the thing. The reason why I create videos like that is because this is what people don't understand about online. And I know people that are online understand this too, is you... You don't get views if you don't do, if you, you don't get views, if you don't do clickbait, but then if you do clickbait, you still get hammered for it, but you get the views. Yeah. Right. So then you think as an entrepreneur, okay, but if I can get into the masses, what do I have to do to really get people to view me so they can see my message further? Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like people, the internet doesn't lie because this is what people want, but people get mad at it anyways. Right. And so it's like, look it's at like, why are you making content that I find intriguing that I learn from that I hate? <laughs> but here's the thing too, you know, Mark is like with relationships, oh, I'm sorry. With relationships, relationships are human psychology. And I'm going to be honest with you in human behaviors. I'm going to be honest with you. If w- the reason a lot of people call this games is because they're looking at relationships. Oh, it should just come easy right? It should just be like land in your lap. It doesn't require this much work. Yeah, it does. My relationship with my husband actually did not require that much work, but it actually took work on myself to understand what type of man was in front of me. And also guess what? He didn't text me every single day and it drew mystery for me to think, when am I going to see him next? And then he would plan that date and that created the attraction, right? Instead of, and that's why I say, I always give this example when I say this, I do give, I don't give gimmicks, tactics, manipulation, but I'll give you like, this is, if you want to get a girl to think about you nonstop, you're going to, you can do this. This is very unhealthy. So I would not tell you because this is what you need to do for sure. And this is what I'm saying that is unhealthy. And I'll call those things out, but also too, think about it. When we go outside in our, just in our neighborhood, there's a stop sign there, right? Somewhere there's red lights, there's green lights, there's yield. Your coffee can't be that hot. You don't like your coffee that cold. You won't eat cold chicken. You got to put it in the microwave. You got to pay taxes, right? There's always something to everything. And I call those rules, right? Mm. But there's rules in life and we're okay with these rules. But then there's a rule when there's rules in relationships and dating, and there's a secret way to do this the right way. Then we have an issue with it, right? Right. right. Because you're, yeah, that's so funny. And Cause, cause it, it feels like it should just, it should just happen. Right. Like, like boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gives girl back. They fall in love. It should just happen. It should just happen. Life's not Hollywood complicated. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny. Cause you know what I, like I met my wife very, a very long time ago. Um, we've been together 21 years. We met in high school, but wow. while you're talking about the things that intrigues women or intrigued yourself, I'm hearing these keywords, like, like, she grew up in a very stable home. I did not. So I left my home when I was 16. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I lived on my own, but she didn't know why intrigued her. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The fact that I was incredibly insecure and very, very shy made me very standoffish, which intrigued her (laughs) this level of (laughs) aloofness. But meanwhile, I was just too nervous to talk to anyone. The fact that she uh, came and approached me and I, and was flirting with me, but I was so dumb that I didn't realize. And I kind of shrugged her off, intrigued her even more. Like as I'm realizing these things, I kind of got lucky, I think. Um, But, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of truth to it where it's, you know, I'm, I'm of the belief, you know, uh, especially in business, 
but in health, in business, and why don't you set a goal and it takes what it takes. And you can like it or not like it, but the truth is, the pragmatic truth is that it takes what it takes to get what you want. Mm -hmm. And you can either play the game and you can either go ahead and, and, and move forward knowing that it'll take what it takes to get what you want, or you can just sit on the sidelines and kind of complain about it. And yeah. so I think perhaps with relationships, it, it might be the same way. What do you think? Yeah, it's just about understanding it, right? Um, it's kind of, I look, at, I look at myself and my business as like I'm breaking a mold, mm. right? Because my legacy is to help build a program for people to be taught relationships and dating. Because what worked for our grandfather and grandmother and our great grandmother and grandfather will not work for us now. No will kidding. not. <laughs> Right. I mean, imagine if people would be like, well, you're weird. What is happening? You know, why are you trying to set me up with uh, your brother? You know, like all the time. Why are you trying to set me up what, with every single What do you mean ever? you want to go for a walk? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the thing is, too, is like, it's just about understanding and relationships and taking the time to really understand this new, I hate to say new way, but it is a modern way of dating, right? And everything is new to us. Everything is different now when it comes to dating relationships. And it's not about games. It's really about just understanding the human psychology, the human behaviors behind it. And my biggest thing is I see so many people getting into relationships and going all in and, and just not giving that person any chance to work for anything. And as humans, we always desire something more when we know we have to work, put in some work for it, right? So the same thing happens with women towards men and men towards women. You know, when you men call me and you're like, how do I get this girl? Because she's not paying attention to me. <laughs> basically. Right. So like it's, it, and then I get, and, and I see what you mean. I appreciate you being honest, being like, well, why is she saying this? But that's what I mean is like, I'm trying to crack a mold. So I think I have a 10,000 times more love on my community. Cause they see one of my videos, I do this from my heart. Right. I think there's a difference between, I, th I think there's a lot of people that are not doing it from their heart, but with it's me, there's a very different tone that I take in my videos um, as well as a message, you know, and I give the reasons of why I think this way. And, and it's proof I've coached over 5,000 people from all over the world. I mean, that's mm -hmm. in crazy. Yeah. And, 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 and I won't stop because I love the coaching. Um, but yeah, so it's just about creating that relationship dynamic because it all does go around. I think it's all about just understanding human behaviors in a relationship and really understanding. I think women need to understand a little bit about men too, especially now with this whole movement of everything going on, right? I think it's really important because I see this divide happening more than ever with women and men blaming each other for doing X, Y, Z. And the divide needs to stop because of women and men need each other. Men need to women, women need men, right? And so I don't like when people are like, I don't need a man, I don't need a woman. Well, that's great if you just wanna just be alone all your life. But like, sometimes that comes from fear. So there's this huge divide happen happening in between the sexes. And it's like, why is this divide happening? Because we're pointing figures. More time. Yeah, I think you were just gonna go there. Do you think they spend more time wanting to be right than wanting to understand? Yes, 1000%. And I think um, a lot of it too comes from blame, you know? Um, I am, trust me, I am such an advocate for a lot of these movements that have been going on because they're amazing and they've helped so many women, including myself, um, in the corporate world. But here's the thing is, but there's also a dark side of it too, right? Or I've seen the bad side of it. Um, and one of the things that it's creating, it's also creating a, a, a set of, a mindset, I think also too, that, um, and it's not like it's me meant to do this. It's not meaning to do this, but a lot of people are looking at this as like blaming and shifting blame on men that have abused them, right? Especially women. But let's be clear here. I think it's now seven out of 10 women have suffered from abuse from men, right? And then I look at that and I say, why are seven out of 10 men have suffered from men, suffer women suffer from abuse? And I look at how I work with men. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of anger. That's a, mm -hmm. There's a lot of passive aggressive in there. Mm -hmm. And there's because men can't show emotions. You can't be weak. So what we're doing is we're pushing down all of their emotions and saying, don't deal with it. 
And so of course it's going to come out in some way because no one's teaching men the right way to be vulnerable. Now I'm not a woman that's going to tell you, but gush out your emotions to a woman and be all emotional. No, it's about how do you show vulnerability in the opportune moments and creating those two things to come together because then women on the other side, they're like, I want to be this independent woman and I don't want a man to take away my independence. When a woman tells me that I'm like, what makes you think a man would take away your independence? Number one. And then number two, what's so wrong about you just being feminine at times and just saying, I want a man to show me too, that Mm. he's got my back. Right. Because a lot of times women lead with their independence. Great. I think a lot of men love an independent woman. Don't get me wrong. I mean, my husband, look what I do. You know, my husband loves it. But the difference is having a healthy balance with your independence and not saying this is, I don't need a man. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I don't need him to do this. I don't need X, Y, Z. He can't take my independence when, when it's like a divide. It's like, how do we come together in a relationship of interdependence together as a partnership? And I think that's where the divide is happening because we're shifting blame, but nobody's really focusing on like the battle of the two. It's either women need this and that's it. And that's why also too, I stepped in the men's spaces because I really do believe that men need a woman that is just in there, not being biased or anything, but just there to hear them out there to be a resource for them as well. Just the last question I have for you today, and I really appreciate your time. This has been, I could, I could talk to you all day. This has just been (laughs) an awesome conversation, but for you in, in, um, your bit, we talked about your, your life, your business, your practice, the men, the women that you're working with for you, what does this come down to at the end of the day? It all just comes down to what? I think what it all comes down to is it's just what I'm supposed to, that's really what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm here on earth to do this. Like I had no other reason to do this, but just because I'm supposed to do it. Right. Um, you know, I had a conversation with a guy last night, you know, and, and this is really important. I think as coaches or anybody that's in the coaching industry, I had two conversations last night. One conversation was with a man that was, I had a woman that he dated online for a year, unfortunately, never seen his face, gave him 70,000, gave her $70,000. And one of my advice on what was happening and why she was pushing away. And because he's got a plane ticket to go out there. And I said, this is a scam. I'm sorry, but this is a scam. Please don't send her any more money. And he gets mad at me. And he sends me an email saying he's going to rate my business so horrible, blah, blah, blah. And the whole call, I'm just like, please don't send any more money because he's in denial. Of course, he's $70,000 invested, right? So as a coach, you get, when you're really wanting, you're doing this from your heart, that stuff brings you down. That's why I said, this is a blessing in disguise because it lifts me up in doing a podcast like this because it aligns me back on my purpose because I receive an email like that and I just see so much fear, but also too attacking my business. It hurts, no matter how popular, whatever, I don't, my, I, I, it hurts me. I, I asked my husband today, how does someone overcome that? How do you get harder X shell? And he's like, babe, when you do it from your heart, good luck. You don't get a harder shell. And so you have that. And then my call after him was a guy that I was FaceTiming. And he said, do you know that you saved my life? And I was like, no. And I was like, what do you mean? And this happens often to me. And he goes to me, I was literally sitting on my floor, looking at my closet and looking at my gun. And the reason why I never suicided myself is because of the fact that I remember you talking about this in your videos and your voice was replaying in my head, in my head, in my head. And I remember you just saying, go for a run, go for a run. And it was just your voice because of the videos that I watch. And I went for a run and now I'm so happy I didn't do that. And The fact that that man can not only emote his emotions to me and tell me the truth about him wanting to suicide himself, but the fact that there's content online that can help, that I can help men get out of that position is exactly, to finish off that question, why I'm doing this, is because of moments like that guy. Anytime I have a guest tell me, I'm gonna get real here, I secretly get super, super excited about what's about to come next. And I loved 
having the chance to have a real conversation with Apollonia. Okay, three key takeaways from this talk. Number one, your purpose, your true purpose comes from your past, your past pain, your past lessons, the hard things you learned along this path that we call life. And it's your job to dig into that painful past and discover your true purpose and then go and share it with the world. Okay, number two, trauma in no way decreases your value. Actually, the opposite is true. Your trauma will help you. It'll actually help elevate you to a whole new level when you create something special out of that trauma. And number three, your perspective, the perspective you bring to your current challenges and your past events totally, totally shifts your reality. You can't change what happened to you, but you can change your perspective of those events and you can change it to serve you if you choose to do so. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to that little voice of fear that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, you have got to face the difficult and the scary and the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It never is. But always remember, we aren't just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. If you need to fix your life and get more shit done, you have got to hear how this woman, named one of the top 10 women changing the digital landscape for good, breaks it all down. Click on the video right over there to hear the real inspiring conversation.